Hi, today we're going to talk about managing the design process. In some of our previous lectures, we've looked at this process and we've looked at some of the ideas for specking out a project and, and developing project requirements. And so we're familiar with this diagram in the lower part of the screen that represents the design cycle. Um, however, if you go from an idea through the design process to a, a final outcome, as we've talked about, it's not always clear when you start what your final outcome is going to be. And going through this process helps this, this vision clarify over time. And there are tools available to the person who manages the project, the engineers on the team, that really helps clarify this vision. And we're going to briefly go over a couple of those today. Um, we're certainly not going to cover all of them. Many tools are proprietary to companies, and we're not businessmen or industrial engineers here. But, but let's talk about some of the more common ones that are used in design. One of these is the functional decomposition or, or, or block diagram. Another one is the work breakdown structure, which manages the effort required. Another one we'll talk about uh, manages your most valuable resource, which of course is always time. You find you're always short on time to do things, and that's the Gantt chart. And finally, we'll talk briefly about the role of the project manager as well as a lead engineer on a project. So let's get started with the functional decomposition or block diagram. The really key thing here is the word functional. Uh, a block diagram basically breaks down a project into its, its functional units. And this is an art as well as a science. And so the question we want to ask is what happens when a device gets too complicated for a detailed schematic or, or a diagram of all the parts to be easily interpret interpreted? And, and this device here is from Stanford Research Systems. It's an electronic device called a locket amplifier. It's an analog device, and it's actually fairly old. I have it in my laboratory, and at times I've had to go in and repair things or really figure out how it works. Um, so I downloaded the product manual, and I really couldn't show you a schematic because it's on multiple pages and far too complicated. But what you see here probably on your video screen is a gray blur, but to me is a list of components, is about 150 of the 1,148 components in this electronic instrument. And certainly with, with over 1,000 components, you can't look at a diagram and understand in any way how this works because the human mind just can't keep this much information in its head. So what do we do? How do we get a holistic understanding or an overview of how this device works? And we need this if we're eventually going to design something. Well, the way we do this is through the block diagram or functional decomposition. And this is the block diagram of the analog lock and amplifier that's downloaded from the manual. Um, it's complicated looking, but it's not nearly as complicated looking as if there were 1,148 different components here. And if you look at this and really examine this for an hour or two, you can understand with a basic knowledge of electrical engineering how a lock and amplifier really functions. This is a beautiful example of a block diagram. So let's look at some of the features of this. Um, first of all, every block on this page describes a function. Um, this one happens to be something called an input discriminator. But each one of these symbols represents a different functional part, not components, not physical layout on the board necessarily, but a function. And that's the real key to understanding what a block diagram is. Block diagrams, if they're good, use standardized symbol. Here the triangle represents amplification, and this circle with an X in it represents a device called a multiplier. Um, the lines on the block diagrams, and it's a little hard to see probably, but these are arrows, show the flow of power, data, signals, anything that moves through here shows an is shown by a line. And the lines really show how this information or power signals will move through a system from part to part and get acted on by each part of the system. A good block diagram like this one has additional information which provides clarity. There are some figures here and some graphs that really show how this works. So you can understand it just by looking at this diagram. And finally, a block diagram clearly indicates the system's inputs and outputs. Here are some of them that I've highlighted in purple. Um, so when you look at this block diagram, an engineer will know what they're putting in, and they'll know what they're getting out. And the block diagram really helps you in the design process to get a mental representation of what it is you have to build. If it's complicated at all without a block diagram, you will not be able to build it. Um, 
Block diagrams evolve over the life of a project, and the rate of change of your block diagram, the exploratory phase, when you're starting to, to explore the parameter space, you know, block out the solution space and see what solutions are, they should change very quickly. But the rate of change should slow to practically nothing about halfway through a project, because otherwise you can't build something that's continually evolving. And here are some examples of a first block diagram by one of the teams in the design class I teach. Um, this is version 1.0. And over time, um, by the end of the project, um, we'll see what the block diagram looks like in a minute. So let's fade that one out and fade the new one in. This is a fairly nice block diagram. You notice the block diagram has gotten a little bit more complicated. You'll notice there's more information describing what things are. One of the nice things they did is they've coded the blocks by who's responsible for them. And so they have a little color coding scheme down here as well. They're also using different symbols for RF communication via wired communication. Um, so, so really, the more detail you put in a block diagram up to a point, it really helps your reader. The next tool I want to talk about is the work breakdown structure. Now, while a block diagram helps you determine how you're going to build a system, the work breakdown structure is used to help you determine what effort is required to complete the design process. So let's look at an example that I've downloaded from Wikipedia. This is a work breakdown structure of building a bicycle if you went to a bicycle shop and bought components. Um, and the, the hyperlink, if you want to take a look at work breakdown structures in more detail yourself, is down here. Um, we see a couple things with this work breakdown structure. It has different levels. We've got a level 1, a level 2, and a level 3. And as we go deeper into the levels, levels 2 is compl more complex than level 1 and gives more detail. Level 3 gives more detail than level 2. We also notice that the total amount of work, in terms of relative terms, is always given as 100%. So to build a bicycle, it requires 100% of our effort. We then break building that bicycle down into parts, the frame set, the crank set, the wheels, etc., etc. And this total also comes up to 100%. But let's take a look at something else. This part of our work breakdown structure, the frame set, the crank set, the wheels, the brakes, the shifters, probably correspond very, very closely to the block diagram of a bicycle. But also on the work breakdown structure here, there are some things that don't correspond to actual functions of a bicycle, the integration, the project management. These are things that take effort, but are not part of the function of the bicycle. And then in the next stage, we break each of these things down at the next level. You'll notice here we have detailed numbers talking about the overall percentage of effort required to put the bicycle together. You'll notice that overall, building the re rear wheel and testing the bicycle are going to require much more effort than anything else, but we also notice always we sum to 100% effort. So your work breakdown structure really is a way that helps you determine how much time you're going to put into things, what the potential time sinks are, how to allocate time, identify where some bottlenecks in the design process might be, and it also gives you a holistic perspective of the work required and integrates very, very closely with the block diagram that should be the first step in understanding and outlining your design. While the block diagram helps you determine how you're going to build the system, the work breakdown structure determines the effort required. The Gantt chart is the tool that most people use to set deadlines and keep the project on schedule, to actual manage, actually manage your time, that most valuable of resources. Here's a Gantt chart that corresponds to the block diagram we saw earlier put together by a team. Let me focus on some features of this Gantt chart. Um, the horizontal axis that I just highlighted in yellow uh, corresponds to time. Each of these little ticks corresponds to a day. Um, the bigger ticks correspond to weeks or months. The vertical axis is organized by tasks. These tasks are taken directly from the work breakdown structure. So on the the level two or level three work breakdown structure. This might be a task. This might be a task. And the subtasks on the deeper levels are given by these individual lines. Horizontal bars on the Gantt chart give the time allotted for each task, when it will begin and when it will end. We notice the horizontal bars are, in fact, color-coded um, by the person responsible. So by looking at a Gantt chart that's done well, not only do you know 
what you should be doing at any given period of time, you also know who's responsible for it. Um, and notice the colors match the block diagram. So there's this, this holistic vision for putting project management together. You can also, at any point in time, see who's going to be working and who isn't on a good Gantt chart. The person who's light green here has a lot more responsibilities at that vertical axis than any other person. Finally, one thing that sh should be obvious, but a lot of people really don't understand, or at least don't take deep into their heart, is that the end of the bar represents a deadline. This is when something is due. If you don't have your work done by the day that bar ends, the entire project needs to get shifted, the Gantt chart gets reorganized and changed, and you eat up a lot of additional time and other resources and meetings to sort of redo the project management and rethink about things. So be aware that once you make a Gantt chart, you have set yourself some very firm deadlines for getting things done. Finally, let's conclude this with talking about the project manager. Now we're getting into details of the specific class that I teach at Oklahoma State University. Um, but a project manager really helps facilitate all of this, makes the project flow, communicates deadlines with people, makes sure people, the engineers on the design team, as well as the customer and management and anybody else involved in a design project, really understand where the project is. And one can think of the project manager as balancing the costs the schedules and the specifications. Um, in this class, the class that I teach, the project manager is responsible for documenting the team projects by, by creating management records, technical records, project records, and notes from various meetings. They organize regular meetings. They are responsible for archiving the project so if information is needed later, um, it can be found. They acquire things and facilitate the job of the engineers and they attend demonstrations so they understand really sort of where the project is. Another person you may have um, on a project is a lead engineer. And this is somebody who has a technical big picture, unlike the big picture of the project manager that looks at the deadlines and getting the project to completion. A lead engineer may really understand the project in a technical, holistic picture. Um, the lead engineer may research interconnections between blocks and the block diagram, make sure everything talks to one another. Uh, obtains measurements of signals so they know that everything is up to spec, um, putting technical information on the block diagram so everybody knows their inputs and their outputs as the individual engineers work and design blocks. A lead engineer also can specify types and locations of connectors because you'll find that in an electronic project, connectors are going to be your biggest headache and there's a huge field of engineering devoted to choosing and designing connectors. Um, doing system integration demonstrations, your lead engineer often does your demonstrations, and of course writing the characteristics and the performance characterization sections of a data sheet when it comes time to communicate the final results of the project. So hopefully this has given you a, a large view of some of the useful tools available to you to manage a project and not only manage a project, but really help explore the design space and understand the constraints of a project.